Okay, so welcome to our first part of Joshua. We're going to have a journey through the whole Bible. So hopefully, like I said, we'll probably be here uh, easily five to ten years. Okay, so to just to give you a heads up, the Hebrew Scriptures, the Hebrew Scriptures, we always do the Torah cycle, and the Torah consists of the first five books, okay? And the Hebrew Scriptures, or what people call the Old Testament, the Jewish people call the Tanakh, and the Tanakh is the acronym for the T for Torah, the first five books of the Bible, the N for Nevi'im, which is translated prophets, and that starts with the book of Joshua. And then there's the Ketuvim, which is translated writings, and it consists of all the other books that are not in the prophets or in the Torah. Okay, so to make it easier to say, people add an A, Tanakh. But the A, it really does not exist. As you know, in Hebrew, there is no vowels. So T for Torah, N for Nevi'im, K for Ketuvim, and Nevi'im is Prophets and Ketuvim is the writings, which includes the Psalms, Proverbs, all the other books that are not included in the first uh, five books or in the prophets, okay? The second part of the Bible, what we call most of the time the New Testament, another way of calling it is the first century writings, or in Hebrew would be Brit Hadashah, which means New Testament in Hebrew, okay, or New Covenant. Or you can also call it Apostolic Writings. I prefer to call it First Century Writings, but that's me, okay? So eventually we'll get there, like I said, five or ten years from now. I'm using this Bible. This is the Hebrew English Bible. And so I'll be going according to the format that's here, which is usually the Hebrew format, which is going to be Torah, Nevi'im, and Ketuvim. This also has a New Testament, <coughs> Hebrew and English. Okay. Now I prefer to use this one because there are certain things in Hebrew that when it's translated to English or any other language, you're not you're, you're missing the, the, the point or the, or the richness of it. So I have a few words that I have marked. So what's the name of it? Hebrew English Bible, and this is by the uh, Bible Society of Israel. This is I bought this one on my last trip to Israel, and you can get it online if you go to the Bible Society of Israel. The thing is that the shipping in cost is almost the same price as the Bible itself, because it costs a lot to mail it from Israel here, but you can find it on Amazon, and you can find it through the Bible Society. It's a very good Bible, and it has this complete. It has both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Okay? So Joshua, the book of Joshua is the book that follows Deuteronomy. And as, we, as you know, <coughs> after Moses dies, Joshua is left in charge. Really? Yes, ma'am. Why, why, what is the age of Eight. For Tanakh. I so you can pronounce Tanakh yeah. without the uh, vowels. It's hard to say Tanakh. Thank you. Okay, so the thing is about Joshua. What is Joshua's ori original name? Hoshea. Hoshea or Oze um, Hosea. Hoshea means to save or salvation. Okay, and there was a point when Moses changed the name of Hoshea to Joshua, which in the Hebrew is Yehoshua or Yehoshua, which means Yah or Yahweh is salvation. So this is important, and we've said before that when the Lord changes the name of a person is to uplift their status in a spiritual sense or because they have now a different destiny to fulfill. Okay, so that's important. If we go to chapter 1, 
Remember, we are trying to go through the first seven chapters. Chapter one deals with the transition of leadership. Okay, Moses dies after 40 years of, of taking the people through the wilderness. Remember that the goal was to enter the promised land, the land that Yahweh had promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So as they're going into the, new, to the land, to the promised land, Moses is already uh, has died, and now Joshua is taking over, or Yehoshua. One of the things that we also need to know about uh, Yehoshua is that he's from the tribe of Ephraim. Okay. Not only that, Joshua or Yehoshua was also the disciple of Moses. Joshua was like a shadow to Moses. Everywhere that Moses went, he went. He was learning from Moses. And remember that in the Hebrew mindset, a disciple or a Talmud, the purpose of that individual is to imitate their rabbi or their teacher in everything. They have to memorize the words of the teacher. They have to live a life exactly like their teacher. In other words, be a shadow and imitation completely of their teacher. That's why Yeshua would say that everything that he had learned, he learned from his father, imitating his father in everything because in a way, even though he's the son, he's also a disciple he's learning so that means that you guys have to imitate me my words my accent everything just the good don't do the bad just the good okay no, I'm just kidding so in the sense of Joshua that's what he was with Moses so the person remember before Moses dies he asked the Lord who's going to be in charge now of the people and he chooses Joshua one of the things that we have to see that during this time usually in the ancient culture Anybody that was a successor to a leader, it was because it was either their son or it was already through a dynasty, kingship, or uh, it was inherited. But Joshua is not related to Moses, but yet the Lord chooses Joshua. And that has, uh, is significant because of his name, because really who brings us to the <laughs> promised land? Through whom do we come really to Israel? To whom do we really come through? To the Father. Through Yeshua, which means salvation, or Yahweh also is salvation. So the person to bring the people of Israel into the land has to have the name of salvation because that's part of the process. Okay, so that's why it's important to know that Joshua is the one. So when the book starts talking, it specifies in chapter 1 that it says, Now it came about. After the death of Moses, the servant of, the, of Yahweh, that Yahweh spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, to the sons of Israel. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given it to you, just as I spoke to Moses. So what we have here is what's called divine approval. Why a divine approval directly from Yahweh? Because Joshua is not a son of Moses. He's not in, uh, inheriting this position. He is being given this position, and the one who's giving him this commission and this position is Yahweh himself. So the Lord recognizes him now as the leader, and now the people also have to recognize him as the leader. So there has to be a divine approval and then approval by the people. And we'll see that in some other verses. And it says that, in verse 4, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and as far as the great sea toward the setting of the sun will be your territory. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you nor forsake you. 
It's interesting that when in Hebrews says, will not, is the word lo, which is no or uh, do not or shall not, which means that never, when the Lord says lo, I will never, fors I will not forsake you or not fail you or anything like that. He means never. Never is never. The same way the commandments are given are given with the word law. You shall not kill. You shall never kill. You shall not steal. You shall never steal. Okay, so that's different than just saying if they were, if he was to say al means not to do it but in that moment in the present okay uh i don't want you to drink that coffee now okay so that's now if i said law do not drink that coffee means don't ever drink that coffee okay so when the lord gives the commandments he says never or law or do not is never okay but so he's telling joshua I will not fail you or forsake you. I will never fail you or never forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Verse 7, only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the Torah which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you may have success wherever you go. So this is conditional. The land to which he, he's going and leading the people, he will have success if he does what the Torah says. It's conditional. He says in verse 8, This book of the Torah shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed, for Yahweh your Elohim is with you wherever you go. This is covenant language. This is an oath. This is a promise to Joshua, because remember, that the task that he has now is not an easy one. He has to bring all these people to the land, and then he has to not only bring the people, but he has to conquer the land and then distribute the land according to the tribes, which is not an easy task with, task with so many people, as you know what happened to Moses. So if, if we continue on, also in that first part of the chapter when he, when he gives the limits, of the land from the river Euphrates to here to that. He's giving the boundaries of the land and that has to do with a land grant. A land grant from the king, which means that no one can take it away and that always, always that land is there for all the descendants. Okay, no one can take away that land which is something we should remind people in the Middle East. And then again, the Lord is encouraging him. Be courageous. Be strong. I am with you. The way, same way I was as Moses, I'll be with you. Don't be afraid. Keep on going. So imagine, at this point, after all those years, remember that, Mo, uh, that Joshua and Caleb are the only two people left from the original generation that came out of Egypt, of all those millions of people, he's the only one, and Caleb, so that he's seen everything, and he's seen that the Lord can truly be trusted. Okay. Now remember, uh, in the rest of the chapter, it talks about the tribes of Reuben, of Gad and Manasseh, because they had to stay on the other side of the Jordan. They were not going to cross over because they had already requested that property from Moses before they, before they got to the land. And so now Joshua is giving them instructions of what they're going to do. If you go to verse 16, 
of chapter 1. Here we see the approval of the people recognizing that Joshua is the leader. Remember that we have approval from the Lord. He has been chosen by the Lord to be the leader, and now the people also have to approve him as a leader. If you go to verse 16 of chapter 1, it says, They answered Joshua, speaking about the tribes of Manasseh, Reuben, and God. Or Gad, not God, Gad. They answered Joshua, saying, All that you have commanded us, we will do, and wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we obeyed Moses in all things, so we will obey you. Only may Yahweh your Elohim be with you as he was with Moses. Anyone who rebels against your command and does not obey your words in all that you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. So those are the words of affirmation from the people accepting Joshua as leader. So that's the first chapter. And remember that he was to meditate on the Torah day and night. That was also commandment for kings, not only meditate on it. They had to write their own scroll. Why? Because what's going to give them success and prosperity and let them know how they're going to be uh, just and righteous <clears throat> and leading the people is the Torah. If they move out of the Torah, they will not have success. Okay. Now in chapter 2 is the story that Joshua sends two spies to look at the land. And as, as you read, I don't know if you noticed that the things that, that Joshua does or happen to Joshua are kind of inverted from the things that happened to Moses. So basically he's going through the same things that Moses did except in a reverse manner. So he sends two spies. And it says in chapter number two, Then Joshua the son of Nun sent two men as spies secretly from Shittim, saying, Go view the land especially Jericho. So they went and came into the house of a harlot whose name was Rahab. Now the thing about Rahab, even though they always mention her as being a prostitute, most likely she was the innkeeper of that place. Uh, what is it that you call those places? Brothel. 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 So the thing is, most likely she was the innkeeper, but either way, because it was a place of prostitution, they always mention her as being a prostitute. So there's always that uh, uh, question, question, but the sages believe that she was not a prostitute, but she was a, the innkeeper of the place of prostitution. So they went and came into the house of a harlot whose name was Rahab and lodged there. It was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men from the sons of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. And the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, you have, ent who you have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them, and she said, Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. It came about when it was time to shut the gate at dark that the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. So another thing is that when you read the Bible, especially uh, the prophets and even the book of Chronicles and the other books, they're not written in the format of history books the way we have. Okay? The purpose is not so much to detail history. Okay, so the purpose is not so much to detail history, but to by telling these things to either exalt a king, a leader, or something that's going on in, uh, in, in war and victory. Okay, so the purpose is not so much to detail history like we have in our history books. In the year so-and-so this happened, in the year so-and-so this happened, and you have a more like a, a detailed history information. The purpose in the Bible about the history is to exalt the happenings or the things that were going on either by a king 
or by a warrior or by a leader. In this case, you're going to notice that when Rahab takes the spies and hides them is because everyone in Jericho has heard about the uh, powers of Yahweh, the God of Israel. So basically what the historian, the person that's writing, is to exalt Yahweh, what Yahweh has done with Israel from the moment that he took Israel out of Egypt and now is bringing him to the land. So at this point, the king of Jericho has heard that these guys are there. They know it's, they're from Israel. First of all, most likely they're dressed differently. Uh, they're strangers, and most likely Jericho was probably a small city. It was like a, a, like a fort. And usually we can tell it was like a fort because a place of prostitution. The soldiers would come and have their good times and whatever, but then they would leave. So it was more like a post, and it was small, but it was small enough that already everybody had heard about the men of Israel that they were ready to cross and come through Jericho. And they already have heard about all the awesome things that the God of Israel has done for their people. So it says, and she's saying, pursue them quickly. But she, verse 6 of chapter 2, but she had brought them up to the roof and hidden them in the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order on the roof. Another thing that we need to understand is that in the culture at that time, they, their roofs, they would use it to dry um, uh, flags or dry things or their food or some things, but that's where they would do that. And so she hid them under the flags. It says, verse 7, So the men pursued them on the road to the Jordan, to the fords, and as soon as those who were pursuing them had gone out, they shut the gate. Another thing is the gates in those, I don't know if you've seen movies, the gates of these places are huge and heavy and because they know Israel is on the other side ready to come in they close completely all the gates so no one could go in and no one could go out verse 8 now before they lay down she came up to them on the roof and said to the men I know that Yahweh has given you the land and that the terror of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you for we have heard how Yahweh dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. When we heard it, our hearts melted and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For Yahweh your Elohim, he is Elohim in heaven above and on the earth beneath. So she's declaring, now that doesn't mean that she's converted. That doesn't mean that she's making Yahweh her God. Because <coughs> remember that the Canaanites had many gods. But they understand that this God, the God of Israel, he's done all these things. And so they are afraid because they see what happened to these other two kings. They've seen what happened when they to Pharaoh. They, I mean, they haven't seen, but they heard. Okay, so imagine during this time, even though there was no Facebook and there was no internet and there was no nothing like that, they still were able to find out of all these wondrous things that was happening with the people of Israel. And it says, verse 12 of chapter 2, Now therefore, please swear to me by Yahweh, since I have dealt kindly with you, that you also will deal kindly with my father's household and give me a pledge of truth and spare my father and my mother and my brothers and my sisters with all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. So the men said to her, Our life for yours if you do not tell this business of ours. And it shall come about when the Lord Yahweh gives you the land that we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. So because she hid them, now she's making them swear that when they come to conquer the land, conquer Jericho, that they will spare her father's house, which meant everybody in that household. Okay. And they're saying, we will do because you did good with us, we will do good with you. And verse 15, then she let them down by a rope through the window for her house was on the city wall so that she was living on the wall. Now remember what I said, if the, if the place is a small fort, <coughs> one of the things they used to do during that time was they would build houses uh, uh, next to each other and kind of the, the 
the wall of the houses will may be part of the wall of the city. And remember they use uh, uh, bricks and mud, okay? So that's the way they built. So if I have a house here and a house here and a house here, so that became part of the wall. So that's why it says that she, her house was on the wall. And as we'll see later on, when the walls fall, everything falls except her, her house. house. So she's, uh, and she most likely, uh, they're coming down a rope through the window of her house it's not too tall either where she's where her house is. Okay, so they're they're able to go down because remember that the gates have been closed. Mm -hmm. So it says, verse 16, she said to them, Go to the hill country so that the pursuers will not happen upon you, and hide yourself for three days until the pursuers return. Why three days? Because during that time it was told soldiers, if you're going to go after strangers or enemies. <coughs> You have only three days to find them and bring them back. If in three days you don't ha you haven't found them, then you come back to the fort. So basically, they were she knew about how long it would take for them to search and look, and so she's telling them, "It's going to be three days. You hide, but I don't think it's a coincidence. Three days, the number three, which means is is from uh, behalf of the Lord that this is happening. As you remember, there's a lot of threes in the Bible." The tabernacle has three areas. The Ark of Noah, three areas. Um, the Levites, Levites, priests, uh, the Levites, the priests, and then the high priest, always in triplets, has to do with, uh, with God, things that he orders. So they went and they hid themselves for three days, and as we know, they came to uh, Joshua. And in verse 24, it says, uh, but before that, uh, go to verse 18 on chapter 2. It says, unless when we come into the land, you tie this cord of scarlet thread in the window through which you let us down and gather to yourself into the house, your father, your mother, your brothers, and all your father's host household. So basically the thread, this, this scarlet red thread is the signal that everybody's inside the house. And he tells them, the, the two spies, whoever is not in the house, it, they're at their own risk. But if you want to be protected, you have to be in the house. And remember that the house also is symbolism for the temple. You're saved within the house of Yahweh. Okay? And the scarlet thread, even though church and Christianity says that has to do with the blood of Yeshua, for them, they didn't know about the blood of Yeshua. This is a, a place of prostitution. Have you heard about the red light district? Yes. So that red thread was saying that she was available. That's all. Okay, so, because they're not thinking about Yeshua and the blood of Yeshua, that, that, that doesn't exist for them. They understood that that meant that she was available. But for them, for the spies, they knew that meant that Rahab and her family are all in her house. Okay? So the thing about... <clears throat> What's going on, Rahab understood about the reputation of Yahweh. To know about the name of Yahweh is to know about his reputation. And remember that in the Middle East, especially during this time and this culture, a name is very <coughs> important. Names are important because names have to do with reputation Names have to do with destiny. When you name a child of yours, whatever name you give them is their destiny, uh -huh. according to what the Hebrew understanding. And the name of Yahweh is his reputation. That's why Jews are so jealous about the name of Yahweh. Because if you misuse the name of Yahweh, whether it's written, spoken, or in whatever format, that's why they don't say the name of Yahweh, to avoid destroying his reputation to avoid tainting his name, his reputation, because the name is very <coughs> important. Okay? Baruch Hashem. In chapter 3, what we have now in chapter 3, <coughs> bless you. What we have now in chapter 3 is the instructions of how they're going to deal with Jericho. And it says in chapter 3, verse 1, Then Joshua rose early in the morning. 
Another thing that we have to understand about um, when the Bible speaks about mourning, it's a reference to redemption. When it speaks about evening, it's a reference to exile. That's why Yeshua rose in the morning, early in the morning has to do with redemption. So it says, Then Yeshua, uh, Yeshua, then Yahshua rose early in the morning, and he and all the sons of Israel set out from Shittim and came to the Jordan, and they lodged there before they crossed. At the end of three days, the officers went through the midst of the camp, and they said, When you see the Ark of the Covenant, of Yahweh your Elohim with the Levitical priest carrying it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. However, there shall be between you and it a distance of about 2,000 cubits by measure. 2,000 cubit is approximately 3,000 feet. Okay. And why the distance? Because the ark is the most holiest furniture of the tabernacle and of the temple. The ark represents the throne of Yahweh. And that goes before them, in front of them as their, as their leader. Because why? Yahweh is the one leading them into the land. And the distance between it is so it will not be contaminated. The distance between the ark and the people around it. Remember that when they were encamping, they were encamping in the wilderness. The encampment was in a military style. So when the ark is moving, they're moving out like a military unit. Okay, and the ark goes in the front, <coughs> and the tribes are alongside it, following the ark. They're following Yahweh, because it was the, the custom during this time in this culture <coughs> that when people went out to war, nations went out to war, they carried their king on a, uh, on something, whatever. No, it could be a horse, but they also had a like, like a, a poles, like in like a chair. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so they would always have their king because the other nations would have to see their king, and then this king would have to see the other king. But with Yahweh, they had the ark. No one could see a king. I mean, a, a person, but everybody knew that that represented the God of Israel. Even though they couldn't see, they knew that there was power in that God that's sitting on the throne that cannot be seen. So that was go first, and then the people follow it. But the distance is to avoid contaminating the ark and um, to not contaminate the, the sacred space around the ark. Because if you remember, when the ark was being brought back to the city of Jerusalem, Uriah, one of the guys that was next to the, to the, to the what was carrying the ark, the right. carriage, the cart, right. It, it kind of tumbled, and he touched it. What happened to him? He died. He died. And you're going to say, oh, that's so cruel. He was, I mean, well, probably most of us would have done the same thing. But you're not supposed to touch it because it represents the most holiest furniture and the presence of Yahweh. You cannot come to the presence of Yahweh if you haven't been cleansed, if you haven't been through rituals, if, if you don't follow the protocol. Because I assure you, he was not going to let that ark fall to the floor. But the uh, reflex is to try to stop it, and because he tried to, t he touched it, he died. Remember also what happened to the sons of Aaron, the first two. Yeah. So God has a protocol, and we need to respect it and to honor it, because that has to do with his honor, his glory, and his presence. It has to do with sacred space, it has to do with Kedusha, what's called Kedusha. So verse 4 again from chapter 3. However, there shall be between you and it a distance of about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it, that you may know the way by which you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. Then Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow Yahweh will do wonders among you. The same thing that Moses told the people when they were at Mount Sinai, when Yahweh was to come to the mountain to give them the, the Torah. And Joshua spoke to the priest, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross over ahead of the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went ahead, ahead of the people. Verse 7. 
Now Yahweh said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. You shall moreover command the priests who are carrying the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When you come to the edge of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. So Joshua spoke these words to the people. Verse 10, Joshua said, By this you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will assuredly dispossess from before you the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Hivite, the Perizzite, the Gergeshite, the Amorite, the Debusite, all the ites. Behold, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over ahead of you into the Jordan. Now, now then take for yourselves twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one for each tribe. It shall come about when the soles of the feet of the priests who carry the Ark of the Yahweh, the Lord of all the earth, rest in the waters of the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan will be cut off, and the waters which are flowing down from above will stand in one heap. So what do we have? The same thing that was happening with Moses and crossing the Red Sea. This time it's the Jordan. Because the Lord is telling the people, the same thing I did with Moses, I'm doing with you, and they will know that I am with you. Now, those of you that have been to Israel recently, and you've seen the Jordan, the Jordan doesn't look that ferocious, right? It, you know, because it it's, has dried up some. And there's some areas that is completely dry, so the waters have. But when this was happening, the River Jordan was was uh, a big and overflowing. Okay, because by the time when they're crossing is a time when the river banks are uh, kind of like uh, what happens with the tides here. Uh -huh. So the waters were high. But it says that the Levitical priests go with the ark as soon as they their, one of their foot touched the water. It came into dry land. Remember that the dry land represents the temple. And the waters represents chaos. So what are they showing again? Dominion over chaos. Dominion over enemies. And so going through the dry land was this new generation who didn't see what happened with Moses and, and the Red Sea and, and the Egyptians. Now they're being witnessing this of the Jordan, the waters heaping on one side and heaping on the other, and they're going again through dry land. Remember that all the people that were going to the other side of Jordan cross over, except for the tribe of Reuben, the tribe of uh, Gad, and part of Manasseh. But the men crossed. The women and the children stayed. But the men, because they were going to help their brothers defeat the enemies of the land, they went over with them. Okay, So all the people crossed finished crossing the Jordan as they had said. Chapter 4. Now when all the nation had finished crossing the Jordan, Yahweh spoke to Joshua saying, Take for yourself twelve men from the people, one man from each tribe, and command them saying, Take up for yourself twelve stones, from here, out of the middle of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet are standing firm, and carry them over with you, and lay them down in the lodging place where you will lodge tonight. So tw twelve men, each one represented, representing the twelve tribes, and they had to pick a stone. So if they're in a river, most of the stones in the river are not that huge. They're, they're nice, shiny, uh -huh. black stones usually. So each one had to take a stone. And it says in verse 4, So Joshua called the twelve men whom he had appointed from the sons of Israel, one man from his tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross again to the ark of Yahweh your Elohim in the middle of the Jordan, and each of you take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Israel. Let this be a sign among you, so that when your children ask later, saying, What do these stones mean to you? Then you shall say to them, because the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall become a memorial to the sons of Israel forever. So the stones represent <coughs> a memorial. So they took the stones from where the priests were standing. 
And it says in chapter uh, verse 12 of chapter 4, the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh crossed over in battle array before the sons of Israel, just as Moses had spoken to them. About 40,000 equipped for war crossed for battle before Yahweh to the desert plains of Jericho. <coughs> verse 14, on that day, Yahweh exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel so that they revered him just as they had revered Moses all the days of his life. So they're seeing again, at least not all of them, because the new generation didn't know the things that Yahweh had done. But the new generation is seeing how Yahweh is with Joshua. How these, this thing, I mean, uh, for this to happen is a miracle. It's something that you don't expect on a daily, on a daily day, you know, daily. is something that the Lord did, that they crossed over on dry land, like they did at the Red Sea. Verse 18 of chapter 4 says, It came about when the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh had come up from the middle of the Jordan, and the soles of the priests' feet were lifted up to the dry ground, that the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and went over all its banks as before. So as soon as the last priest came out of the waters, that last little toe came out of the water, the waters again return to their flowing, natural flowing. Okay. Verse 19. Now the people came up from the Jordan on the 10th of the first month and camped at Gilgal. What is the 10th of the first month? What first month? Aviv. 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 First month is the month of Aviv in the Hebrew calendar, also known as Nisan. So this is day 10. Remember the people had to consecrate themselves to cross over. And it says, <clears throat> verse 20, those 12 stones which they had taken from the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. He said to the sons of Israel, <clears throat> when your children ask your fathers in time to come saying, what are these stones? Then you shall inform your children saying, Israel crosses Jordan on dry ground. For Yahweh your Elohim dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed, just as Yahweh your God had done to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until we had crossed. That all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of Yahweh is mighty, so that you may fear Yahweh your Elohim forever. <clears throat> so it's not only as a memorial to Israel and their children and their children's children, is for all the lands in that area know what Yahweh did with them by crossing the Jordan. So now the people, the kings in chapter 5, the kings of the Amorites, everybody is, is scared of what they had seen and what is going on with the people of Israel. And in verse 2 of chapter 5 it says, At that time Yahweh said to Joshua, Make yourself flint knives and circumcise again the sons of Israel the second time. Now it's not that they were circumcised and they're being circumcised again. The same people. Remember, this is a second generation. What is it's a reference in the sense that the first generation that was that came out of Egypt was circumcised. And now this generation that's going in cross that had just crossed into the land. Remember, it's the tenth of Aviv. What happens on Aviv? What feast? Passover. Passover. No one that is uncircumcised can celebrate Passover. That is a ruling of the Torah. Every male that, that celebrates Passover has to be circumcised. So remember that now they have crossed the Jordan into the land, and now the new, this new generation has to be circumcised. So it says... So they made these knives and says, verse 3, So Joshua made himself flint knives and circumcised the sons of Israel at Gibeah Haaralot, which means the hill of foreskins. So imagine all these men had to be circumcised. No wonder there's a hill of foreskins. <laughs> Verse 4, this is the reason why Yahshua circumcised them, 
all the people who came out of Egypt who were males, all the men of war, died in the wilderness along the way after they came out of Egypt. For all the people who came out were circumcised, but all the people who were born in the wilderness along the way as they came out of Egypt had not been circumcised. For the sons of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness until all the nation, that is, <coughs> the men of war who came out of Egypt, perished because they did not listen to the voice of Yahweh, to whom Yahweh had sworn that he would not let them see the land which Yahweh had sworn to their fathers to give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. Their children, whom he raised up in their place, Joshua circumcised, for they were uncircumcised because they had not circumcised them along the way. Now when they had finished circumcising all the nation, they remained in their places in the camp until they were healed. Verse 9. Then Yahweh said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. So the name of the place is called Gilgal to this day. Why? Because Gilgal means a rolling away. So the circumcision, by them being circumcised, in that place where they had just put the 12 stones, memorial stones of, ha of them having crossed the, the, the Jordan River, the Lord was taking away all the reproach, all the oppression, everything they had gone through in Egypt. So now it's kind of like a clean slate, and we're starting all over again. You're circumcised. You you're now are now are approachable to me. We're in the land that I promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You have crossed dry land. I have taken you like he did the, the first generation. Verse 10, while the sons of Israel camped at Gilgal, they observed the Passover on the evening of the 14th day of the month on the desert plains of Jericho. On the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. The manna ceased on the day after they had eaten some of the produce of the land so that the sons of Israel no longer had manna. But they ate some of the yield of the land of Canaan during that year. So till that moment, they were still eating manna. As soon as they came into the land, they got circumcised. They did Passover. They ate of the fruit of the land. The manna stopped. I mean, the Lord was faithful to them to the last minute until they were able to eat of the land flowing with milk and honey. Do you think he's faithful? Yes. Verse 13. <coughs> now it came about when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked. Remember that when you hear uh, the word saying, he lifted up his eyes and means he's looking into the future. It's also something that's going to happen in the future. He says, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for adversaries? And he said, No. Very typical Jewish answer. No, rather I indeed come now. Here it says, uh, my version is captain of the host of Yahweh. But in the Hebrew is the word Sar. Sar means prince. Prince of Yahweh. And not only Prince of Yahweh, and don't tell me that uh, <clears throat> he's a Prince of Yahweh of the host of Yahweh. Commander. Or commander. The translation, but in Hebrew is the word Sar, which means Prince. So he comes, and not only that, this Prince is the messenger a royal messenger because he becomes becomes on behalf of Yahweh and not only that he represents Yahweh in everything okay that's why he's a royal messenger so he answers no rather i indeed come now as prince of the host of Yahweh and Joshua fell on his face to the earth and bowed down and said to him what has my lord to say to his servant Adonai is what he's saying, Adonai. 
The prince of the Lord's host said to Joshua, Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. So this is a royal messenger. This is a representation of Yahweh himself. That's why he says, Take off your sandals, because where you're standing is holy ground. The same thing that happened to Moses in the burning bush. In other words, who is this? Yeshua. Well, it's not really Yeshua because he's not called Yeshua. The Memra, the Memra, or the Prince of the Covenant, the Prince of the Host, because he allows Joshua to bow down to him. Okay. And it's holy. It becomes holy ground. Only the presence of Yahweh can make the ground holy. His presence is what brings holiness. That's why it's called sacred space. If his presence is not there, there's no holiness. Okay, holiness is not only uh, it's not it not only means that you're you're good, you don't do anything bad. That's a consequence of, but holiness per se means the presence of Yahweh. He's absolute holiness. So if this messenger is in a complete representation of Yahweh, where he's standing is holy ground. Chapter 6, it says, Now Jericho was tightly shut because of the sons of Israel. No one went out and no one came in. Again, they're fearful. They have heard everything that's happened because of the God of Israel. Verse 2, Yahweh said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and the valiant warriors. You shall march around the city all the men of war circling the city once. You shall do so for six days. So these are the instructions on how to capture Jericho. Now, if you're in the city and nobody can go out and nobody can go in, and you got over 40,000 men circling around the city, Once for six days. Everybody's probably looking over the walls and going, these people are nuts. What are they doing? Right? So he's, the instructions are, you shall march around the city, all the men of war circling the city once. You shall do so for six days. Also, seven priests shall carry seven shofarot, Trumpets of ram's horn before the ark. So the ark is also circling around with the Levitical priests. There's seven priests. Why seven? The temple represents temple. Represents the temple. Perfect. Perfection. Perfection. Seven priests and each one has seven shofars. Each one has a shofar. Plus the ark. It says, also seven priests shall carry seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. And it's interesting, in the Hebrew it's called Shofarot Ha-Yovelim. Ha-Yovelim. What does that sound like? Jubilee. Jubilee. It's yeah. horns of jubilee. What's the jubilee for? Liberation. 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 That adds a lot more to it than just saying seven ram's horns. So they shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. On the seventh day, then on the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. So each day, they went around, and they blew the shofar once. Okay. They did this for six days. Seven priests, seven shofarot. Blowing ones, but then on the seventh day, how many sevens? One, two, three sevens. The three sevens also is a, a representation of the name of Messiah, Yeshua. Okay. So on the seventh day, they have to go seven times and blow <clears throat> continually as they're going around seven times. It says, 
Verse 5, chapter 6, it shall be that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when do you make a long blast? The war, where else? What feast do you make a long blast? Yom Teruah. Yom Teruah. <coughs> says, it shall be that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and if you remember Mount Sinai, there was a long blast when Yahweh was coming down to the mountain to bring the Torah. So all this is connected. This is a second exodus. The same thing, except now it's with Joshua. And when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people will go up every man straight <coughs> ahead. So remember, there's all these millions of people was the men of war, the ones going around, but when they hear this long blast, everybody's going to shout. Now, why do the walls come down? Just because? Well, he ordered it, but, but the way he's ordering it has a reason. He just doesn't do things just to do it. The sound, the frequency. Everything has a specific frequency. Everything. Have you ever heard about these ladies that have a high pitch and they sing so loud, so so high that they can break a glass? Yes. It's because that sound has reached the frequency of that glass and so that glass can break. It's physics. So when they were going around and all those seven shofar road was sounding at the same time and the people shouting along with the sound of the shofar. It reached the frequency of the wall and it came trembling down. Everything has a frequency. That's why, and I said this before, there's two things that absorb <coughs> sound. Stones and bones. That's why Yeshua, the father told the prophet Elijah to speak to the bones. Ezekiel, Ezekiel. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> he said, speak to the bones. Why? Because the bones retain sound. The same thing when you go to Israel, to the wall. For those of you that have been there, if you've been to the rabbi's tunnel, under, the, under the, uh, that wall, the original, original stones are under that wall in the rabbi's tunnel. Those stones have heard every single word that all the priests of all the years have been in Israel, in Jerusalem, in the temple that they have spoken, all the prayers, everything that Yeshua spoke. Why do you think that he said, if you don't, uh, if you won't uh, praise me, the stones will? Those stones in Israel people have all the words from the moment that God spoke. All that word is in the stones. Why do you think most of, of Israel is limestone? Because limestone is porous like bones. So it absorbs. All the, the same thing with the shofar. The shofar, even though uh, there's dif different uh, shofar, some, some shofar have a very deep sound, others have a less deep, and they have different frequencies. When you blow a shofar to a person that's sick, there's healing. When you hear the sound of a shofar, for the first time if you hear it and, and you just don't know how to explain it, it's because that's going into your bones, into your DNA. That is in there, that sound. When the Lord spoke, that's why he had to speak. That's why the men were, that's why Yeshua is the word. Is that word that gets into your bones. Who said that? Who said that it was like fire in his bones? Jeremiah. Jeremiah. He wasn't kidding. Because that's the power of the word. That's why Yahweh, when he started creating, he spoke. That word is in space going on forever and ever and ever. That's why I always say when you speak to your children, even when your children are not at home, you speak that word, that word goes to them. That word keeps on going for your fa for your loved ones, for your children, for your grandchildren, even for your future generations. You just have to speak the word of the Lord. And it will reach them somehow, some way, because that's God knows physics. So that has to be. That, that will not change. 
So they did that. So they did according to what the Lord said. So remember that they go around for six days. They blow the shofar, and it was on the seventh day that they had to do it seven times. Verse 15 of chapter 6, it says, Then on the seventh day they rose early at the dawning of the day and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. Only on that day they marched around the city seven times. At the seventh time, when the priest blew the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city shall be under the ban. Now, um, under the ban, I don't know how what your translations say, but when it says under the ban, in the Hebrew, the word harem. And harem is something that the Lord designates, almost like saying holy, but set it's not apart. that it's holy. It's, it's, it's set apart for him. And only he has the right to say to destroy it. And if he says destroy everything, you destroy everything. Because if you go against Hedem, anything that the Lord has set apart for himself, if you go against that, which another way of saying uh, sanctified, you commit ma'al. And oh, I've spoken about that before. Ma'al means that he has every legal right to judge you, to come against you with judgment for committing uh, against his harem. Write your thought down, then we'll talk. <laughs> okay, so he says, The city, verse 17, The city shall be under the ban, Hedem. It and all that is in it belongs to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot and all who are with her in the house shall live, because she hid the messengers from, from whom we sent. But as for you, only keep yourselves from the things under the ban so that you do not covet them and take some of the things under the ban and make the camp of Israel accursed and bring trouble on it. So if anybody took anything that the Lord said has to be completely destroyed, they would bring curse not only to the person, but to the whole nation. 19, but all the silver and gold and articles of bronze and iron are holy to Yahweh. They shall go into the treasury of Yahweh. So of everything that they, they that has to be destroyed, the only thing that they can leave and that's going to belong to the treasury of the Lord is silver, gold, bronze, and iron. So the people shouted and priests blew the trumpets. And when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted with a great shout and the wall fell down flat, so that the people went up into the city, every man straight ahead, and they took the city. They utterly destroyed everything in the city, both man and woman, young and old, and ox and sheep and donkey with the edge of the sword. And you're probably going to say, that's what some people say, why is God so cruel? Because if they leave those people, they're going to be a snare unto the people of Israel. They're going to contaminate them, and they're going to follow their ways. And the Lord says, no, you cannot do that. So I have to eliminate anything, any possibility of you committing treason against me, of you committing idolatry, of you going against my covenant. Yes, it sounds cruel, but none of these people are in covenant with Yahweh. None of these people are doing things right. They're doing unimaginable things with their gods and all the idolatry and all the things. So the Lord has to eliminate them if he's bringing his people there. The land has to be cleansed. <coughs> you only are to leave what he said you can leave, be uh, leave behind because that's going to the treasury of the Lord. Verse 22, so Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, go into the harlot's house and bring the woman and all she has out of there as you have sworn to her. So they go in, they find Rahab, Rahab, and it's interesting because the wall falls down, but nothing happens to Rahab and her family. They're safe and sound. And her house is part of the wall that comes down. It's part of the wall that when it heard the blowing of the shofar, that frequency, it should have come down too and fallen on, on them. It could have killed them, but it didn't happen. Why? Because they made an oath in the name of Yahweh to Rahab that nothing would happen to you because of what you did for us. Your kindness, your mercy, your compassion. You took care of us, we'll take care of you. 
Verse 25, however, Rahab the harlot and her father's, father's household and all she had, Joshua spared. And she has lived in the midst of Israel to this day, for she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. So what does that mean? That at first she knew Yahweh from hearing, but now she knew Yahweh personally. Now she's part of Israel. At first she just had heard about him, but now she knows about him in the sense that she personally experience. has an experience with Yahweh. Verse 26, Then Joshua made them take an oath at the time, saying, Cursed before Yahweh is the man who rises up and builds the city Jericho. With the loss of his firstborn, he shall lay its foundation, and with the loss of his youngest son, he shall set up its gates. So Yahweh was with Joshua, and his fame was in all the land. I think I read once that uh, some people have tried to build up the city of, of Jericho the way it was in the beginning. And um, archaeologists have found within the pieces of walls bones of children. So really, 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 they built these walls with the bones of their children like this says here. How and why, I don't know, but I, I know I, I read that somewhere. Why? Because whatever... If the Lord says you don't do this, and if you do it, there's a curse, it's going to be fulfilled. And then verse uh, chapter 7, it says, But the sons of Israel acted unfaithfully in regard to the things under the ban. In Hebrew, it says, The sons of Israel committed ma'al, ma'al, because they went against the harem. What the Lord said not to take, there was a dude called Ahan, from the tribe of Judah, who took some of the things under the ban. Therefore, the anger of the Lord burned against the sons of Israel. So just to comment on that, chapter 7, what happens is Gaiachan, he decides to take some of the things that he saw because they found them pretty beautiful, and he took them with him and hid them in his house. The, uh, Joshua decides to take the city of, of Ai. First of all, the Lord didn't say, go and take the city of Ai. He did it on his own. Number two, when they go against the city of Ai, they were defeated by the people of Ai. And so all the Israelis, the people from Israel, the men, came running back with their tails between their legs. And so Joshua is like, oh, my God. You know, the same thing like Moses did. Why have you brought us into this land if you're going to kill us? That people are going to say about your name that you brought us here to be um, captured. And so they're, and, and God says, Joshua. Get up from your face. What are you fussing about? Someone has committed ma'al. That's why you didn't win against these people. So go out and see who it is. And so they start drawing lots to see who comes out. Because that's the way they did it. Lots to see who was uh, guilty. And it turns out as they went from a tribe to a family to a clan, they found that it was a Khan from the tribe of Judah. And they confront him. Uh, Joshua talks to him and he says, what have you done? What have you done? And so the guy confesses, yes, I did take this and I did take that. And so it says, verse 20 of chapter 7. So Achan answered Joshua and said, truly I have sinned against Yahweh, the God of Israel, and this is what I did. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful mantle from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold, 50 shekels in weight, then I coveted them and took them. And behold, they are concealed in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath it. So Joshua sent messengers to check and see if this was real. Verse 24, then Joshua and all Israel with him took a Khan, the son of Zerah, the silver, the mantle, the bar of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that belonged to him, and they brought them up to the valley of Ahor. Joshua said, Why have you troubled us? Yahweh will trouble you this day. And all Israel stoned them with stones, and they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. So because Achan coveted something that the Lord said you could not take, he went against the ban or the harem, he committed ma'al, so the punishment was death. And the problem is, 
that because they went as a nation to fight against Jericho, what he did affects all the nation. So therefore, it affects all his family, him and his family, everything that had to that he had had to be burned. Remember what happened with Korah? The, the earth opened yeah. and, 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 and swallowed, and swallowed and everything. So because of this of the sin of one, it affects everybody else. Because remember, this is about community. What you do, if you shame, do something shameful, it shames your whole family, it shames the whole nation. If you do something honorable, it honors the whole family, it honors the whole nation. Because remember when uh when the high priest said uh, that it'd be better that one man die than all the all the nation. So Yeshua died on behalf of everybody, because one thing that you do affects everybody. So here, Achan's family had to pay for his mistake. And the thing is, they were burned, but they at least had some compassion and stoned them first to death before burning them alive. Verse 26, they raised over him a great heap of stones that stands to this day, and Yahweh turned from the fierceness of his anger. Therefore, the name of that place has been called the Valley of Ahor to this day, which I think means the Valley of burn, Burning. So in other words, they get into the promised land. The Lord gives them instruction. You follow my Torah, you have success, you have prosperity in the land that I have given you. You go against my Torah, you have to go through the consequences of disobedience. The problem is, if one person disobeys, it affects the whole family and the whole nation. And when the Lord calls something cherem, or he sets something apart for himself, and he says, you don't touch this, you don't do anything, and if you go against that word, you're committing ma'al. And ma'al is very serious. It gives them legal rights because of the covenant to bring about judgment. Now we can have some questions. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, chapter 6, verse 26, where Joshua put the curse on the city of Jerusalem. Cross-reference uh, uh, yeah. Cross that with First Kings sixteen thirty-four, where that came into play. Yes. Yeah, yeah First Kings sixteen thirty-four. Not too long ago, I think I heard somebody from Japan wanted to build a a uh, a huge city in Jericho. He wanted to build like a let's say like a tourist place or something, and. Uh, of course, a very rich person, and I think like within a year, uh, the worst, it, it was either the worst, I think, earthquake in Japan happened, and so this guy couldn't, couldn't then, had to leave his plans and go back to Japan, no. and that was recent, I mean, I'm talking about a few years ago, so that, that curse is still there, yeah, whoever I tries heard, to build. Yeah, because it says in First Kings. 1634, in the days of Eo, the Bethite.